Good afternoon. This is Jackie Seneschal, your host for the speaker series by the Historical Society of Harford County. This month, we're going to present a discussion of the Concord Point Lighthouse and the Keeper's House, led by Carol Allen. Carol is the executive director of the Concord Point Lighthouse, and she's going to review the results of archaeological digs that led to the renovation of the Keeper's House. Carol? Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. So I'd like to uh, start by thanking the Historical Society of Harford County for this opportunity to share a small slice of the history of Concord Point Lighthouse and Keeper's House, which is nearly a 200 year history. Uh, my thanks go out also to those who are participating in this Zoom brown bag lunch, either in real time or viewing the archived version of it at a later date. But above all, I want to thank Bill McIntyre for allowing me to use slides and text from his recent presentation on the Concord Point Lighthouse Keeper's House and property, which he delivered uh, earlier this month at the Havre de Grace City Hall for the Archaeological Society of the Northern Chesapeake. Uh, his full presentation is available on YouTube, and I encourage you to take a look at it because there's a lot more to what he had to say than what I will be sharing with you today. As many of you may know, Bill's expertise about the Lighthouse and Keeper's House is unparalleled and far exceeds what I've managed to learn in my short eight, <clears throat> 18 months as executive director. Uh, many of you know Bill personally, I'm sure, but for those who don't, I'll just briefly mention that he has an MA in history and also a Master of Liberal Arts and a Certificate of Advanced Studies from Johns Hopkins uh, and other studies in addition, and spent over 30 years teaching social studies and mathematics in Baltimore County Public Schools. So uh, although um, this is uh, listed as me, as the presenter today, uh, really it is going to be much more so presentation of what Bill said to a uh, audience about uh, two or three weeks ago. So my role is just to, to sort of touch some of the highlights, starting with the um, fact that the need for a lighthouse and the decision to build a lighthouse and keeper's house in 1827 occurred in a context in which there was an era of growth for a new nation expanding after the War of 1812. The development of the new nation's commerce focused much on its inland waterways with the construction of canals such as the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, and our own Susquehanna and Tidewater Canal, as well as others. Thus, uh, aids to navigation on the water were needed, and uh, this was expressed by Benjamin Latrobe in a letter to Thomas Jefferson as early as 1804. Uh, and this slide quotes his statement that a lighthouse is needed at the mouth of the Susquehanna River. A lot of the information that I will be sharing with you today comes from um, a major report done by the Clio Group um, and that was done prior to the archeological digs and, and reconstruction, renovation, restoration of the Keeper's House. A copy of this report is available at the Keeper's House Museum. And this along with a report by Bill that I'll mention later is the source for much of the material <clears throat> in this presentation and an invaluable resource for us on a regular basis. Back to the history now, uh, with the establishment of a stronger central government under the then new constitution, the construction of lighthouses, what to build, where to build, by whom and how much they should cost, came under the authority of the treasury department and was overseen by the fifth auditor of the treasury, Thomas Pleasanton. Pleasanton relied upon agents of varying districts to carry out the specifics of this work. The agent responsible for this area, the fifth district was uh, William Barney. Barney was a major of dragoons in the battle of North Point during the war of 1812. 
And many of the figures who were important in the early history of the Concord Point story uh, were veterans of the War of 1812. In his negotiations for the property, Barney found that the city fathers would not sell the land required for the light tower and keeper's property right along the shoreline because the land was leased to individuals for fisheries, which were the sole or main source of income for the city. In the end, only a 22 square foot parcel could be obtained for the lighthouse itself right at the shore. And the keeper's house was located farther away from the tower than is typic was typical at the time. This photograph from about 1900, looking south from Concord Point, provides us with a picture of what the fisheries may have looked like in 1827. The uh, story of Concord Point Lighthouse, uh, in it, two men, both named John, figure very prominently, as I'm sure most of the listeners know. Uh, John O'Neill, the first keeper, and John Donahue, the builder. And I'm not going to go into a lot of that history today, but on this slide, um, I'm presenting um, a list of the 13 different lighthouses that were constructed by John Donahue and uh, all of them on the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. Um, he, like O'Neill, was prominent in civic affairs and both of them served in the militia during the War of 1812. At that time, the preferred form for the lightkeeper's dwelling was a story and a half Cape Cod style cottage with an attached kitchen, such as those that are seen in this slide here. Uh, although um, John Donahue worked uh, somewhat on the Bodkin Point, he did not work on Greenberry Point, and he was not the uh, total constructor of either of those two light uh, dwellings. This slide shows an artist's conception of what the keeper's house probably looked like. This would be the Concord Point uh, Lighthouse Keeper's House, what it probably looked like in 1827. We do not have any um, actual drawings of it from that time, and of course, no photographs at that time. Uh, this uh, conception was put together um, using information found in the contract for the construction of the lighthouse and looking at other dwellings that um, had remained more intact, um, such as the two seen in the earlier slide and uh, they're more intact in their original form. There were a lot of changes to the keeper's house, which is gonna be the main focus of uh, the rest of the presentation, talking briefly about how those changes occurred and then how those changes later were undone as part of a restoration. Here's an abridged chronology of the construction of the site and the keeper's house dwelling. I'm not going to read through everything. I'll just give you a moment to look at it over yourselves. But I want to mention that these were really only the main uh, changes that were made. Uh, there were other minor ones that are not on this list. And the key one for you to look at is the sale of the property in 1920, uh, when the keeper's house was no longer needed. I'll talk more about that in a moment or two. Here is the earliest known illustration that we've been able to find so far of the lighthouse. Um, it appeared in a book titled The Pictorial Field Book of the War of 1812 by Benjamin J. Lawson, published in 1869. Of course, the lighthouse was not there during the War of 1812. Uh, so this was a drawing representing how it looked some years later after the lighthouse itself was constructed, and this is saying approximately 1861, that would have been its appearance at that time. Uh, this undated photograph has, um, must date to the period after the 1884 renovation of the Keeper's House, which added a major addition to it, but prior to 1904. I'm gonna show a more detailed version, enhanced version of that in the next slide. So in this enhancement, you can get a better look at the two structures. And you can see in addition to the keeper's house, there was an oil house over uh, what had been the well. 
and an attached coal shed as well as the privy. Um, it looks to be that there's some laundry on the clothesline and perhaps someone uh, working on something at the fence in this slide. Here's another view that is dated to 1904. We can see here that the summer kitchen uh, had been added to the west side of the house and the coal shed has been modified. This view looking east on Lafayette Street dates to between 1904 to 1910. And notice that um, no paving or of any sort on, on Lafayette Street at that time. And uh, there's actually a boat sitting where um, Young Street is now. This photograph is dated 1910, and it shows changes to the outbuilding on the south elevation of the property. That's the Lafayette Street side. Uh, you can see here a structure that is referred to as the high barn in the Clio report, and a new structure across the street, uh, which housed the Haver de Grace Yacht Club. This is the last uh, photograph that we have in our collection um, prior to the sale by the government to private owners in 1920. By 1920, the um, way that the lamp was lit in the lighthouse was now um, powered by electricity. And so there was no longer a need for a keeper or for a keeper's house. From 1920 until 1975, the lighthouse instead was maintained first by the US Lighthouse Service and later by the US Coast Guard. In 1975, the tower was decommissioned as an active aid to navigation. And at that time, the lighthouse and the tiny 22 foot square parcel on which it sits uh, were assigned to the city of Havre de Grace through a quit claim deed. But at that time, the city did not have adequate means to do anything other than put a lock on the door to the tower. And it was then that this group of citizens shown in this slide here formed the Friends of Concord Point Lighthouse with the primary purpose of restoring, preserving and maintaining it and opening it for public visitation. Five of the original members are shown in this slide and I'm gonna read their names uh, from your left to right. Anna Long, Al Marini, Elsie Stackhouse, Jane Jackstite, and Joseph Guzman. The Friends Group was officially incorporated in 1979, and it has had the primary responsibility for maintaining and preserving the Lighthouse Tower ever since. And as you'll learn in a couple of slides more, um, they have maintained the Keeper's House as well. And uh, I just really love this story because it shows so much what how important individual citizens are to preserving and maintaining our history. As I know, um, the Historical Society of Hartford County's members are well aware. And so I always like to give kudos to this group and to all of the volunteers that work so hard to maintain historical structures and build knowledge and celebrate our history um, throughout Hartford County. Big, big celebration coming up for the 250th. As was noted earlier, the Lightkeeper's dwelling and property was sold uh, into private hands in May of 1920. Uh, this picture is, is subsequent to that. It's, this is not a 1920s photo. Um, initially, the house was used as a rental resident for some time in the 20s. And then in the 1930s, it became a restaurant and a dance hall. Uh, it ownership changed nine times from 1920 to 1988, and uh, additions were constantly being made to the property, so that by 18, eight, 1988, when it was purchased in auction by the Maryland Historical Trust, um, it, it, it took up almost the whole block. Um, so the, it was purchased by the Maryland Historical Trust, and they then deeded the property to the city of Haver de Grace, but retained a perpetual historical easement on the property. 
In turn, the city asked the board of directors of the Friends of Concord Point Lighthouse to add to their mission, the restoration and preservation of the keeper's dwelling, which they agreed to take on. The Clio report recommended archeological testing to locate remaining historical elements and to refine the elements that they had uncovered in their investigative work. The major problem for the board of the Friends is apparent in this slide and in the next one. Essentially, the original dwelling, what remained of it was entombed within um, the additions that had been built just about in every direction around the house. Um, so the work was daunting. And at that time, the friends were supporting their work of, uh, which had up until then been um, only the care of the lighthouse, big job in and of itself. Uh, they were supporting that work with only a pancake supper and a spring flower sale. So they did not have the funds to conduct all of the work that was needed to do this restoration and certainly could not do it in one single effort. So the major portion of the task was accomplished in three phases for which the friends raised a portion of the money and the trust provided matching funds. It's important to remember as I go through the rest of the slides and talk that while the city owns the property and the friends manage it, the trust holds a perpetual easement on it. And so we need to check with them um, at points along the way as we want to consider making changes. By 1992, the friends were ready for phase one of the restoration. Based on the recommendations of the architect, um, John Adams, who, uh, author headed up the Clio Group's investigation and report, the board of the Friends decided that they wanted to take the keeper's dwelling back to the 1884 renovation, not to the original uh, structure as it stood in 1827. And there were three factors that were influential in this decision. First, there was too little of the original 1827 structure remaining and there was no existing drawing of the uh, plan for that building in order to um, reliably restore it to that condition. Second, most of the structural remains of the 1884 building were available. And then third and most important, the 1827 renovation or space that was available for the 1827 building would not provide the space that the friends required to create a museum within the keeper's house dwelling. The first phase of the restoration involved removing the pool room along with the main, the floor of the main room and the 1827 to 1884 kitchen and then stabilizing the remaining structure. That work was completed by the fall of 1992. And then the first archeological testing followed that work. This slide here shows the cover of a major report that Bill McIntyre prepared um, in 2008 that uh, gives an incredible account of all of the work that was done for the renovation restoration and the archeological digs. Uh, it was written specifically for the officers and members of the Friends and it's an incredible source of information. We're so thankful to Bill for the hours and hours of time he spent creating this document. And now you can get a look at Bill in this slide. Um, the work was uh, uh, undertaken with support from what was then called the Hartford County Archeological Society, now the Archeological Society of the Northern Chesapeake. Um, and they agreed that they would head up the archeological investigations. Dr. Kenneth Gordon Orr was engaged as a principal investigator. He participated in the first three on-site excavations, but due to failing health, he could not continue in an active role. And the task of PI was assumed by Bill McIntyre. Bill's the one in the baseball cap in this slide. And he can, Bill consulted with Dr. Orr until Dr. Orr passed away. And then Bill um, continued in the role of PI in subsequent investigations. This 
diagram shows the research design and excavation plan that Bill McIntyre wrote under the tutelage of Dr. Orr. And I wanna draw your attention to um, the pits or units um, that are numbered 1, 16, 10, and 14 on your slide. A um, local individual, Phil Powell, with construction, construction skills, provided the surveyor's skill to lay out the site grid in early 1993. That's him at work there. On the weekend of June 19, 1993, ASNC members and volunteers, including some members of the Friends of Concord Point Lighthouse, began the first testing and here's a sl some slides from that day. Um, one of the volunteers found a quartz Piscataway point in the art um, artifact mix of the builder's trench on the northeast corner of the structure, which was a quite exciting find at the time. Here are some more photos uh, from that particular archeological dig. Um, and this is looking at unit 10, which is one of the squares shown on the diagram previously. Um, that's on the northeast corner. And it was taken down to one inch below the footer of the foundation. Uh, one of the test pits was labeled 10A. And from that, the uh, point that is uh, seen in the lower right photo was uh, discovered. So another exciting find, probably prehistoric. A second testing was conducted in October of 1993. Test units were dug along the outside foundations of the 1988 structure in three different locations. All the testing to that date had been conducted in areas outside of the structure, except the kitchen area. And the kitchen area turned out to be one of the most important areas to the restoration and to understanding the overall site. This completed the first phase of the testing. And these 1993 um, investigations provided several important results. First, it established a good soil profile for the site, as well as uh, information about the nature of some of the soil disturbance. Second, it identified several original structural features that had not been discovered by the Clio group's work. And three, it suggested that the site may have been occupied at some point prior to 1827, uh, much prior uh, during the prehistoric period. The phase two demolition called for the removal of the remaining 20th century additions and phase two was conducted in the late spring, early summer of 1995. Meanwhile, the friends had been busy raising funds to provide the uh, funding and the historical trust had provided some additional grant support. The area to be uncovered by this demolition is outlined with the heavy line. The researchers added four more testing locations, three inside the structure, and one requested by the architect on the east side. These are a few views of the demolition in progress. Big, big undertaking. Inside a long rectangular concrete foundation of the building that um, runs parallel to Lafayette Street, and that was attributed to the 1920s, the team was able to locate the remains of the stone and brick foundation of the West Pump House Wall and the West Coal Shed. Two young people who were working on the dig, Wilbur Eiley and Ann Pearson, uh, found several prehistoric stone flakes in this area, giving more evidence of prehistoric presence on the site. Uh, the remains of the 1827 well were also exposed during this excavation. The team also found the threshold stone of the South 1827 kitchen door, that's shown in the top two photos, the post molds and remains of post molds, 
and remnants of a brick pad and a brick walkway leading to the concrete foundation along um, Lafayette Street. Um, and those are the two lower photos. Shown here is the area that was uncovered by the phase two demolition. Portions of the upper brick courses of the well were discovered directly below what had been the dance floor. Elements of a brick walk shown here in red were also visible in the rubber rubble that was strewn on the ground. These two images show um, what the uh, group deemed to be the area of historic archeological significance after cleanup and prior to covering with pervious cloth and in some places 18 to 20 inches of top fill. The covering and fill was uh, put there to alleviate flooding by rain as the area was a foot or more lower than the surrounding ground. And the team knew that there were archeological remains there to be protected for future testing. Now, at the time of all of this work, Bill McIntyre and his team knew that there were at least three different versions of a porch at the east, that is the Concord Street side of the dwelling. The original single bay porch uh, attached to the building in 1827, uh, that was replaced, we think around 1905 with a long porch uh, that was in place for many years. Um, and this porch is seen in, on the 1910 Sanborn map, but not on the 1900 map, which is why we dated at about that time period for its construction. It was replaced uh, somewhere around 1965 by a nine by nine foot concrete block, rubble fill and slab porch. And I'm gonna have some photos of that for you in just a second. The long porch is seen in this photograph that dates to the 1920s. Um, the owner of the, the photograph is someone who dated it to that time period. Note the roof line of a long building at the very left on the Lafayette side of the street of the photo. That is the structure sorted by the rectangular concrete foundation um, that we saw earlier. And that became the dance hall uh, during the 1930s version of the building when it was a restaurant and dance hall. During the 1920s, as I mentioned earlier, the house was apparently a rental. And during his work, uh, Bill was, McIntyre was able to interview two individuals from two different families who lived there at different times in the early 1920s. Uh, note also the canoe filled, used as a flower planter. I'm tempted to say we should put that back in place, but I don't know if we have quite the space to do it now. And it's not an 1884 block, which is what we interpret to. Um, and note also um, a large stone block um, on the right side of the photo. Uh, the stone is most likely a U.S. lighthouse service marker, uh, and that stone is now on display in the Keeper's House Museum. Uh, such a stone would not have been on the property before the 1880s, and that stone was given to the Friends by Bob McGee, who at that time was the director of the Lockhouse Museum, and we appreciate that gift. This photograph is dated to the early 1950s, according to Dave Hansen, whose hands are seen at the right holding a shovel handle. Of interest here is the structure at the left, which was a connecting passage to the dance hall on the Lafayette Street side of the property. And it was attributed to the 1940s. Seen here in the upper two photos, is a nine by nine concrete slab porch attributed to the 1960s owner's renovations. Bill and his team were able to look for evidence of the earlier porches when the third phase of demolition and stabilization was conducted by the Grubb brothers, a firm from Cecil County. 
Around noon of the first day of the third demolition, Bill called Ann Pearson home from college and said, we're ready for you. She came over and they began the excavation of the porch area as the photos uh, here show. Uh, Bill really praised the work of the Grubb brothers in his presentation the other week, uh, noting that they broke up a nine by nine concrete and rubble platform topped by a two inch thick iron plate located in the 1827 to 1884 kitchen. Bill believes that this was constructed to support a stove when the house was converted to a restaurant in the 1930s. Removal of this feature allowed them to do further testing in the area that had been the 1827 kitchen. So that completes the account of those uh, original uh, demolitions and uh, excavations. Uh, but Bill added that in 2008, so a good bit later, the friends decided to put a floor over the 1827 kitchen. Um, and uh, Jack Davis seen in the upper photo and Bill McIntyre returned and completed the excavation of the 1827 kitchen area. The excavations in this area produced more artifacts and revealed structural features that contributed much to interpreting the life of the occupants and the construction of the interior, reconstruction of the interior. This slide shows um, a number of the artifacts that were found during test excavations. And um, these artifacts help to date changes to the property and structure, and also provided a picture of various activities that were carried out by the people living and working here. Most of the, the artifacts shown in this slide are on display in the keeper's dwelling. And most of these came from the uh, kitchen excavations. We actually have more artifacts than we display. We display mostly the ones that are e either most intact or most um, important. Don't have quite enough room to display all of them. The artifacts shown here were all found in the kitchen area. And um, the variety of um, artifacts that were found in that kitchen area suggest that a lot of the life of the families was centered in the kitchen, unsurprisingly. Bill's own favorite artifact, and mine as well, uh, is this hand-painted bowl, which is on display in the Keeper's House Museum. And uh, the broken pieces were reconstructed for the friends by Marge Coates. The Fletcher girls and one other lady familiar with this site in the early 1900s told Bill that Mrs. O'Neill did hand painted pottery. Uh, but whether this particular bowl was done by her or someone else, we don't, we don't really know. The team excavated the entire kitchen and were able to produce a drawing shown here that helped them to understand how the kitchen floor had been constructed. The stones, the stone retaining wall running north to south was mostly intact. And a couple of flat stones were found running west to east from the retaining wall. Along both the east west wall foundation running from the retaining wall to the east wall, they found small niches with flat stone bases to support the floor joists. They are shown in the cross section of the drawing at the right of your view. With this information, uh, they were able to recreate the 1827 kitchen floor and hearth area. Uh, the two people shown here, Floyd Dobson and Jack Davis, did the work. And in his presentation, Bill described himself as the step and fetch it guy for that project. Uh, and if you've not been in to see this uh, reconstructed area, I encourage you to visit. It's, um, it's the, the part of the dwelling that most resembles how it would have looked in 1827 with also information showing the 1884 changes. 
Work at Concord Point well, for the original work stopped around 2000 to 2001. Uh, but in 2004, the friends were required to install a handicap walk and access to the building. So prior to that work, Bill returned to the site um, to excavate and record the segment of the brick wall scene, recorded and recovered after the phase two demolition. And this drawing produced from their investigation of 2004 is shown on the slide here. The red um, indicates where they did the test digging. In this area, they found the answer to where the prehistoric points or blades may have come. An inch or so under the brick wall, they discovered the remains of a prehistoric microsite, that is a small campsite uh, that they um, date to the late archaic period as early as 3,500 years ago. So pretty exciting. Some additional artifacts. Um, and to Bill's knowledge, um, <clears throat> this location is the only prehistoric site uh, and artifacts found thus far in Howard Grace in situ and recorded archaeologically. Um, Bill has seen other artifacts found within the city, but none for, for found within the context of a um, formal archaeological dig. So you have much more information when that is the mechanism for discovering the artifacts. Still, some years later, uh, the friends wanted to excavate and locate proof of where the privy would have been located on the property uh, that had been seen in this slide I showed you from 1910. Uh, and uh, that privy is also shown on the 1900s plat of the property. And Pearson was contacted to act as the PI and wrote a good research design and excavation plan, but the Maryland Historical Trust would not allow heavy equipment to be used to remove the um, overburden of late 20th century material. Um, and so the work did not proceed beyond the preliminary phase. Um, they tried to do a few just shovel digs um, to see what they could come up with, but the results were inconclusive. So here, um, I want to join Bill in uh, giving thanks to all of the ANC, ASNC members and volunteers from the Friends and Community who contributed to the reconstruction of the site and the understanding of the people who lived and worked here and at least uh, perhaps one moment of prehistory passed through uh, while stopping briefly. Um, Bill would want me to recognize these three individuals, uh, Renee Sciotto, uh, Ann Pearson, and Jerry Warner, who um, were all involved with one or more of these uh, archeological excavations and went on to have professions in archeology span or closely related fields. And they all began their um, adventures in, in archaeology by working with Bill when they were around 14 to 15 years old. Um, this work earned the friend the Harvard Preservation Award in 2004, and we've been awarded um, two other preservation awards since that time. In his closing remarks, um, and in uh, conversations with me subsequently, Bill has issued a challenge to the Friends of Concord Point Lighthouse, and I want to extend that challenge as well to members of the Historical Society. He encourages us and others who may want to join us to continue to research the history of these two iconic structures in Haver the Grace. There are stories that have yet to be unearthed, narrated, and recorded about people and events associated with the lighthouse and the keeper's house, especially during the period of private ownership of the house. I invite those among you with interest and expertise in historical research to contact me and let me know how you might personally want to assist in meeting this challenge. You can reach me by email at director at 
And you can learn more at our website, uh, which I think will be shown on the concluding slide by Jackie. Uh, but the address is uh, concordpointlighthouse.org. We also would welcome you to join the Friends of Conquer Point Lighthouse. Um, membership information is available on our website. Thank you. I want to thank you for a really interesting talk. I'm like, I'm like, I got to talk to my husband. We got to go to the keeper's house soon Please so we come. can go through and see these things in place. Um, which is one of the reasons I love doing this work is I find out things about places in Harford County um, or things in Harford County that I didn't know about uh, previously. I had a couple of questions that came up in my mind as I was listening to you. Um, the first is you talked very early on about John Donahue, who was the builder of the lighthouse. Um, and he built, he, he contributed to the construction of a number of other lighthouses. Was he from, Har from Harvard and Grace or was he from somewhere else? Or do you know? Uh, he lived in Havre de Grace. I don't know whether okay. he um, was born in Havre de Grace or subsequently moved here, but he did live in Havre de Grace. And uh, we have a short account um, and a letter um, that is shown on a panel in our main exhibit room uh, recounting that he also had hoped to become the first lightkeeper at Concord Point Lighthouse. Uh, but um, the city recommended John O'Neill as a way to thank him for his brave defense of the city uh, during the War of 1812 when the British invaded uh, Havre de Grace in, in 1813. Uh, the actual decision was made by the federal government, but um, the city recommended O'Neill. Um, so that's, we do have um, a whole um, report that was done by one of our friends um, about 15 years ago, so prior to my time there, uh, it, of someone who became fascinated with the story of uh, John Donahue. And I've glanced through it, but I don't know it well enough to tell you more than what I've told you just now. But it's, a, it's available and anyone who wanted to take a look at it could get in touch with me and I can arrange that. Okay, so both Johns, John Donahue and John O'Neill had strong ties to the city of Havre de Grace. Yes. That's really interesting to learn. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to, um, I have here, the slide that you had that had the cover of Bill McIntyre's report. Can you go back to that? Um, or actually maybe just the last slide you have. I think that's really the one I'm interested in. It's the one that shows both the white part of the building and then the stone part of the building. Yes, uh, I think that's on my first slide also. So let me just get bring that up. Uh, so there's the, but that's kind of hard to see. Right. So I, was, I think the I think the very last one over toward the end, you had a very nice picture of it. Yes. Let me just slide through. I've got about fifty slides here. So I let me just slide through. I guess I should have gone to um, end, but I'm almost there. Uh, yes, this, that, is, that, this is a good view. So the I'll uh, go ahead with your question, but I might know uh, where you're heading with it. I'm just trying to understand, um, is the stone part the the uh, 1827 piece and then the yes. white or is the 1888 pieces? So is that what, is that what I'm see, looking at? Where you see the exposed stone um, on what is the uh, north side of the building. Uh, that is suggests the dimensions of the 1827 house. I don't know if it's 100% precise, but it's uh, because again, we don't know exactly the dimensions of that house, just uh, we know roughly. But that shows um, what the outline of the house would have been in 1827, as we, can, as we can tell from research. But then the whole building that you see now uh, shows the uh, um, building as it was in 1884. Now, do you have? Is, do we have a sense of how far south the 1827 building went? I mean, presumably the door, the front that with the the front door, if you will, is the same one. 
did it go all the way across or was there more than just the additions that got taken off? I guess I'm trying to understand because you said you left it at the 18... 88 size so that 84 size I'm sorry 1884 right. size so that you would have room for a museum and and the ability to actually interpret the building but I'm trying to understand sort of where inside there the and I should have uh, brought a copy of Bill's report uh with me here so I could flip through to give you an answer to that I don't know precisely okay. um but my um understanding is that uh, what you see as the back of the building there uh, was 1827, but as you can see, it was uh, very short. Um, yes. And so the 1884 additions um, raised the height, uh, but then I don't think that they extended the footprint except for the addition of the summer kitchen. Okay. And I don't think you see the summer kitchen in this photograph. No, you don't. You don't. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a question for Carol D. Um, as part of the work that we're doing for Hartford 250, the Historical Society has collected a number of first person stories uh, of 20th century life in Hartford County. Carol, did any of those stories um, include uh, stories of information or recollections about the, the keeper's house or the lighthouse in Haver de Grace? Uh, no, there are a number of stories about Haver de Grace and various buildings, but uh, the lighthouse was not included. And partially, I think it's because we were asking people about the 20th century. So this really predates that. Um, but I did have a couple of, of questions myself uh, about uh, the presentation. Uh, in the very beginning, you talk about the fisheries. And the Havard Grace fisheries have always kind of fascinated me. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about what the fisheries were? Because I think there's a lot of people that don't realize just how important that was and, and what was going on in Havard Grace at that time. I, I cannot provide you with more information on that. As I said, oh. I've only been in this job for, for 18 months and I'm still very much learning. And as I'm sure um, you know also, Carol, um, from your work with the Historical Society um, and the director there, so much of one's time is taken up with administrative uh, work that there's only little snatches here and there of time to become uh, learning about the history. So I'm, I'm still looking for some more of those snatches of time. I, I have read stories about the uh, the fish uh, uh, kills or, or collections in Havre de Grace being so huge in the early days that there would be fish all over the roads and people would be putting them in bas barrels and taking them away to all, all different places. Uh, so I think that will be a fun thing for someone to actually research uh, to go back to what the, the uh, history of fishing in the county, and particularly Havre de Grace uh, and Labanum, were. Uh, another thought that I had, uh, I, I'm sure there are a lot of people uh, that are looking at this today and wondering, what were the duties of a keeper? Because this is a, this is a, a um, position that we no longer have. And, uh, you know, it's things that people would not be uh, familiar with today. So could you tell us a little bit about what the keeper did? Sure. And uh, that that work was is actually mind boggling, um, especially if you think back to the initial period of time, uh, starting with 1827, when the lamp that provides the light for the uh, you know uh, ships that are using it as an aid to navigation was powered by whale oil. And um, the, at that point, the, one of the main responsibilities of the keeper, of course, was to keep the light lit. Um, and uh, it required at that point in time in particular, going over there three times every night without fail to refill the whale oil. And I don't know whether um, either of you have um, 
taken on the challenge of climbing to the top of the lighthouse tower, but the last nine steps are, involve using a rung ladder. So I still can't figure out how that person would have carried um, a, a bucket of whale oil up there, because it sure takes me two hands to to climb that rung ladder. So that was really the, the primary responsibility was to keep the light lit, but they were also responsible for the care and maintenance of the building. So, you know, as needed, doing repainting, um, other sorts of repairs. Uh, likewise, most of the keepers had their families live with them in the keeper's house. And they would have, you know, a vegetable garden, um, the sorts of things that everyone did in those days uh, to feed your family. Um, they needed to keep records and fill out reports that they submitted to the federal government periodically. And um, one thing that we are developing right now are some additional slide presentations. Um, we're doing this with some support from the lower Lower Susquehanna Heritage Greenway, one of their mini grants. And so that's suggesting to me that maybe a slide focusing on that topic would be a good thing to develop. Thanks for that question. Sure. Uh, and if anyone wanted to visit the lighthouse or the keeper's house, uh, could you uh, tell us when you're open and uh, maybe what the hours are? Sure. So um, the main attraction really is the is the lighthouse itself, as we learned during the pandemic when we kept the lighthouse closed because it's such a confined space. Social distancing was really not an option and our numbers just plummeted that year. Um, so because of that, we're very seasonal. We're open April through October. Uh, weekends only, Saturdays 10 to 2, Sundays 1 to 5. Since this presentation is airing on November the 8th, we're actually closed for the season. However, uh, we will be open on Small Business Saturday, so one can view the um, Keeper's House then, look for publicity. I haven't set the hours for that yet. And we will be open the second weekend in uh, December for our holiday boutique. So um, count the days till we reopen come the first weekend in April. And we will have a whole new, um, we're, we're doing a makeover of all of our exhibits on the first floor. We've just uh, nearly completed a makeover of the children's room with support from a Harford County Tourism Award. Uh, we've added a section to our main exhibit about women lighthouse keepers. Again, that was supported through that lower Susquehanna Heritage Greenway grant that we received. And we're refreshing all of the exhibit panels on the first floor. You make well, those, it sound really wonderful. <laughs> so. the, and those all sound like perfect things uh, to use when you market that this is the 250th anniversary of Harford County. And look at all the wonderful things you have done and refreshed in your museum. Um, as part we, of that overall celebration. And we have a 200th anniversary coming up ourselves in, in 2027, which will be here before you know it. So I've got to start finding some snatches of time to be planning what to do uh, for that. Well, this is it's wonderful to celebrate these kinds of, of, of events and this kind of history, because I think understanding where we've been gives us a much better understanding of, of where we might be headed in the future. I wanted one clarification. You said you're looking for stories of people um, who were involved with or had memories of the Keeper's House um, during its time of private ownership. And that would be during the 20th century. That would be that time from 1920 to 1988. Indeed. Indeed. So um, if those of you who have memories of that time, um, many of us listening were alive during that time. Did you frequent the restaurant? Did you dance in the dance hall? Um, think about how you can share those stories and get them over to the folks at the Concord Point Lighthouse. That would be a, an interesting way of thinking about your celebration of your, uh, your 200th anniversary is to talk about um, and have the resources of all the things that have happened in that building, not only when it was a lighthouse, 
but then when it was a gathering place for the community. Indeed. Okay, well, I think it's about time for us to wrap up this interesting discussion. Um, so I am going to share my screen and advance my slide. There oh, we I go. Think I have to stop sharing. I did not do that. Okay. There you go. Okay. I want to thank you in particular for a fascinating, fascinating discussion and all of the folks who are listening to us um, either on November the 8th or at subsequently on our YouTube channel. I want to thank you for joining us uh, for this very interesting discussion of the Conquer Point Lighthouse Keeper's House. Um, if you've not already done so, I do want to encourage you to push that little subscribe button and the notifications button so that you'll know not when each of our new YouTube channel offerings comes out. Um, i remind you that the Concord Point Lighthouse org is the website for the Concord Point Lighthouse. Um, and I've included in here the link to the YouTube uh, talk that was given by Bill McIntyre, which is much more extensive, as I understand it, than the information we learned today. Um, I also want to take a little bit of time to talk about what upcoming events with the Historical Society of Harford County. Uh, our website, of course, is www.harfordhistory.org. On November 30th, we would like to invite you to a lecture and book signing for the book Proving Ground. I don't know how many of our listeners are aware of the important role that Harford County and Aberdeen Proving Ground played in the development of the modern of modern computers. Um, and this book Proving Ground is about the women who devised the software that ran uh, ENIAC, the first modern computer at Aberdeen. It's a fascinating book. Uh, Kathy Clemens is going to be here in Haverty Grace uh, to talk about um, what she's learned um, and to sign the books. That'll be November 30th. And the Historical Society is only one. The primary sponsor of this event is the Discovery Center um, in uh, the southern part, in Bell Camp. And also uh, the Women's Heritage Museum out of Baltimore. So it's a it's a collective um, opportunity for everybody to learn more about the 20th century in Harford County. Um, and finally, in December, we're not going to do a special uh, episode for December, but we'll encourage everybody to look at our episode from uh, when Eugenia, uh, in December of 2021. Uh, visited Harford County and told us about her stories of her her memories of Christmases in Harford County. That's available on the Har Historical Society's YouTube channel. Uh, one more time, thank you all very much. If you've enjoyed today's event, I'd like to encourage you to become a member of the Historical Society. Uh, you can do that at our website. Um, and come back and see us uh, beginning in January. We will have a whole new um, raft of episodes and the whole new collection of episodes beginning in 2023. Um, and those are going to be looking uh, at, again at our past, but they're also the very beginning of our celebration of the 250th anniversary of the founding of Harford County. Thank you very much.